videos on GCSE history's depth study on Germany between 1918 and 45. But by the way, this video isn't going to cover what happens after Hitler becomes the Fuhrer. It's only up to the point where Hitler becomes the Fuhrer of Germany. And it doesn't cover like the start of World War II and what really happens in between at once Hitler becomes the Fuhrer. So in this video, we'll cover the Weimar Republic under Stresemann, the rise of Hitler to become the Fuhrer of Germany. And that's it, pretty much. So it's going to be an all-inclusive long video, so it should pretty much cover everything you need to know on the Weimar Republic and how Hitler becomes the Fuhrer. So sit tight, because this one's going to be a long one. By the way, this video is made on uh, information from the GCSE history textbook, and it's Cambridge, by the way. But all the information here should be useful for different exam boards, too. Let's get started, then. So the timeline of the events. In 1918, the World War, World War I ended. The following year, the Weimar Republic was created, as well as the Treaty of Versailles being signed. In 1922, the economic disaster happened, which caused hyperinflation. 1923, the Weimar under Stresemann. 1929, the Great Depression and rise of Hitler and the Nazis. Hitler becomes Chancellor in 1933, Fuhrer in 1934, and World War II starts in 1939. Now, I know this probably doesn't make sense right now, but by the end of this entire video, it should pretty much make sense. I hope so, at least. So 1914 to 1918 was World War One, where millions of people died when Germany fought with France, Britain, and some other countries. But that's not what this video is about. Some background info from 1914 to 18. 1914, prior to World War I, Germans were leading very prosperous lives. They were doing quite well under the rule of the Kaiser, who was basically a dictator. Kaiser is like a king, but it's sort of like a dictator. 1918 was the end of World War I, and Germany was completely destroyed. As you know, Germany lost the war, so they lost a ton of money, and the economy was basically like destroyed. The people, everybody was surviving on scraps, and the army was basically destroyed. There was a flu epidemic killing thousands of Germans. And by the autumn of 1918, there was chaos because it was evident that they had lost the war. The Allies offer a peace peace for the German democracy. So in exchange for peace, so the end of World War I, Germany would have to become a democratic country. The Kaiser, because Kaiser wasn't really democratic, right? It's a king. The, Ka the Kaiser abdicates, so it basically means like leaves his throne, quits on November 9th, 1918. And Ebert signs the armistice on November 11th, 1918, two days later. So some of the impacts of World War I Germany by 1918. There were social impacts, so that's the effect on people. Economic impacts, so related to money. And political impacts, so the government and politics. Let's take a look at social impacts, the impacts on pe people. It deepened divisions in German society. There were wealth gaps. You know, the rich factory owners who create, who supplied arms for the army, they got rich, but the factory workers, the soldiers, they, there, was, there were huge we uh, wealth gaps. Workers who worked in those factories were, unha were unhappy because the factory owners got rich, but they barely got anything. Disillusioned workers, disillusioned soldiers. Soldiers were disillusioned returning from war. So what does disillusion mean? It means like something is not as good as you thought it would be. So it's, it's like you're disappointed. They return from the war and they're disappointed at the state of the country. Germans are angry because they lost the war, obviously. And angry Germans equal unrest, especially in cities like Berlin, like big cities, Berlin, Munich. There were lots of angry Germans protests. You can imagine, right? Economic impacts. Germany was essentially bankrupt. National income was a third of what it had been prior to World War I. So in 1913, when the war hadn't started yet, the national income was high. Germany was actually a really prosperous country. They were like doing well economically. But once World War I ended, income was a third of what it had been. There were 600,000 widows, 2 million fatherless children. Like, can you imagine? That's a ton of people, fatherless. 600,000 widows. And by 1925, so the state was spending a third of its budget on war pensions, so paying money to like the families of soldiers. A third of its budget. Imagine. Food and resources, there was a lot of shortages of essential stuff. 50% of milk and 60% of butter. So it basically means that 50% of milk and 60% of butter, which was being produced prior to the war, was not being produced. So there was a lot of shortage on it, like essential stuff like milk and butter. You need that for bread, etc. Coal due to fuel shortages. So it was really cold, right? So there were there was basically no fuel in Germany. So 300,000 died due to starvation and hypothermia. Hypothermia is when you die due to the coldness. And industrial production of was two third of what it had been prior to World War One. 
So, political impacts. There was a revolution. War, let, war stress led to revolution from October to November of 1918. The Kaiser was abdicated, as we covered before. He left his throne. He was, he was kicked out in revolution. And there was a new, and the key, th key word here, unstable democratic republic. Extremists attempted to take power, so communists, nationalists, etc. There were fights between the left and the right wing. We will cover this a little bit later on. There were many despised and new democratic leaders, and there was a sense of betrayal. We will also cover this coming up soon. So in 1919 was the creation of the Weimar Republic. So this was the new democratic republic. It was the first time Germany was democratic in its entire history. The creation. In January of 1919, there were free elections for the first time in German history. Friedrich Ebert and his party, the Socialists, they won by majority. Ebert becomes the president of the Weimar Republic. As we can see on the right, we have a nice, humble, smiling picture of President Ebert. Some backstory of the Weimar Republic. The new government met in Weimar rather than Berlin, because even in February of 1919, when the war had officially ended, Berlin was believed to be way too dangerous. There were too many protests, etc. The success of the Weimar Republic depended on two key factors. The Constitution and German people. How would the constitution, how good would it be, and how would the Germans react to that constitution? One thing I want to cover is, why was it called the Weimar Republic? It's because they, the new government met in Weimar, so they were just called the Weimar Republic. The constitution of the Weimar Republic. So it was, bas it was basic principles, as constitution means basic principles and laws of a nation. It's basically like the US constitution. Basic fundamental laws, like what the entire country is based upon. It's designed to be as, uh, the Weimar Republic was designed to be as democratic as possible. It could possibly have been the most democratic country at the time, even more democratic than the US or the UK. And the key thing is, it was too democratic. The power was split too much that nobody would have too much power, so that it'd, be, it'd make decisions really, really difficult. It will come to haunt them sooner or later. And to represent as many groups that made up German society, they used proportional representation. So proportional representation is really bad. It's, it, you know, you, you could see it as both ways, but the downside with proportional representation, first, what does it mean? It means if you get 10% of the votes, so if 10% of the entire German, German population voted for, let's say, the socialists, then you would have 10% of the seats in the Reichstag, which was the German parliament. We will cover this later on. If you had 60% of the German votes, you would have, you would have 60% of the seats in the Reichstag. So it'd be like the percentage you get voted in gets you that number of seats in the Reichstag, the German parliament. So it'd mean that, you know, you'd ha you know, most parties would get like 20 or 10, right? So it'd make like, to have majority, you need at least 51%. And to have that, you would have to be really popular, which is quite unlikely, right? So it'd make one group having a lot of power difficult. So in one sense, it could be good because the power is distributed evenly, but it's also really bad in that, in a sense that you can't really make decisions easily because you'd have to, the different parties would have to come together, they would have to form coalitions and, you know, you'd have to argue and it's a lot of difficult stuff. So it had its downsides. It made decisions really difficult to make. That's the key point. So no individual could gain too much power. All Germans over, 20, over the age of 20 could vote. So it was basically a fully democratic country. And this was the main features of the Weimar Constitution, which was agreed by the National Assembly in July of 1919. Okay, this looks really confusing, right? I'll try to explain it in as simple of a way as possible. So the German people, anybody over 20 could vote. The German people, everybody, everybody, male, female, anyone over the age of 20 could vote. And everybody had equal rights. So the German people were responsible. They voted for two key sections. First of all, like in any country, you voted for the president who was elected every seven years, so you voted for the president. And they also elected the Reichstag. So the Reichstag was the German parliament, right? So proportional representation, 10% of votes means you get 10% of seats. So, so Germans could vote for the Reichstag and the president. Now the president was the person who voted, who appointed. So the Germans didn't uh, uh, vote for the chancellor. The chancellor was appointed by the president whom the German people voted. So appointed from the Reichstag by the president had to be supported by a majority of the Reichstag. So in order for the chancellor to create new laws, he needed to get support from the Reichstag. Now, something that's confusing. There's the president and the chancellor. What's the, what's the difference? Germans vote for the president, but the president basically doesn't really do any day-to-day -day government. He's just like a puppet. He just stays there. The chancellor is really the person who has the power, who does the majority of stuff. But there's an issue. 
to get to pass anything, the chancellor needs to get permission from the Reichstag. It needs to get the votes. But, you know, as we saw before, the Reichstag has proportional representation, which means making decisions and making a clear 51%, like, you know, a clear majority decision gets really difficult. So, there's something. Article 48. I put a warning sign because it gets used in the future by some uh, notable figure. So, Article 48 said in an emergency, the Chancellor could make laws without going first to the Reichstag. So, in, in the case of an emergency, the Chancellor could decide, oh, this is an emergency, let's use Article 48. Let's use my emergency power so that I can pass some laws without having to go through the Reichstag. That's good in a way that you could make laws quickly, right? But, one, that's not democratic. And two, the t the word emergency, it wasn't specified. What is an emergency? The Chancellor could just declare something as an emergency and just say, oh, it's an emergency. I need to use Article 48 to pass my own laws. Now, that could, you know, it could have some side effects in the future, which we will cover. So, just to summarize the German Weimar Constitution, German people voted for the Reichstag and the President, the, pre the Parliament and the President. The President elected the Chancellor, who did the day-to-day -day governmenting, but he needed permission from the Reichstag in order to pass his laws. But the Reichstag had proportional representation, which made majority rule difficult. And the pres the Chancellor had Article 48, where he could make laws without having to go through the Reichstag, but it wasn't a democratic. And the President basically did nothing except elect the Chancellor. Okay, that's it. Let's move on now. Hitler. <laughs> Article 48 foreshadowing something. So the strengths of the Weimar Constitution, as we can see from the picture here, freedom of speech, kind of like the US, right? A genuine democracy, Reichstag appointed government and made laws, so it was democratic, right? And Bill of Rights, guaranteed every German citizen, freedom of speech, religion, and equality under the law, so it's very similar to the US, so in a sense, that it was quite democratic. But it had a lot of weaknesses. Proportional representation made it difficult to pass laws, as we covered. It led to weak and short-lived governments because, you know, a government could never... It was quite unlikely for a government to have majority, and it made a party to have control quite difficult. Article 40 was overused, and it weakened German confidence in democracy because, oh, the, the German Weimar leaders are talking about democracy, democracy, democracy. It's so good, right? You guys can elect us, and you guys can decide what happens. But Article 48 just basically abolishes democracy in the flick of a second a flick of a hand i mean so it was overused and it basically ruined democracy the people would they accept it it the remember the weimar constitution the weimar government relied on two things their constitution whether it be good enough and the people would the german people accept it and would opposition and how much opposition there would be from both the left and right wing so let's see opposition between 1919 and 23 so remember the weimar republic was created in 1919 the unpopularity of the Weimar Republic meant it faced violent uprisings from both sides of the spectrum, political spectrum. From both the left wing and the right wing, they both hated the Weimar Republic, as, as represented by these boxing gloves. The left wing were the Spartacists. They were the communists. Now, Spartacists will come to haunt the Weimar Republic a little bit later. And the right wing, the Freikorps, nationalists, they would also come to haunt the Weimar Republic. So the Freikorps Corps and the Spartacists, the left and right wing, the, the communists and the nationalists, they both absolutely hated the Weimar Republic for their own rep respective reasons. Let's take a look. The left wing communists, who were called the Spartacists. All right. In January of 1919, 50,000 members of the post-World War Communist Party, called the Spartacists, they rebelled in Berlin. It was led by Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. Forgive my pronunciation, I try my best. The Republic was saved when, through the army, it armed bands of ex-soldiers called the Freikorps. Remember the Freikorps? They were the right-wing nationalists. This will come to haunt them. So, it was led by uh, them and Freikorps. So the Freikorps, the Republic, the Weimar Republic, armed the Freikorps, who were bands of ex-soldiers who lost their jobs due to the end of the World War One, right? So the Weimar Republic armed these Freikorps to try and combat these Spartacist communists. The Freikorps managed to, to defeat the Spartacists, and Luxembourg and Liebknecht, who founded the, Fre uh, the Spartacists, were murdered in the process. And in 1920, there was another Spartacist uprising, and uh, although it was quite deadly on both sides, lots of deaths, the Freikorps managed to defeat them. Ebert clashed with the communists often leading to long-lasting bitterness. Long-lasting bitterness. This will come to haunt them 
in like a decade time in a decade's time <laughs> the uh, ebert had german support because germans didn't really like the communists that much and they were afraid of communist germany something happened in russia where there was a civil war and communism led to the soviet union so the germans didn't really want that to happen in germany and despite all this the communists remain a, lo a strong anti-government force throughout the 1920s. Although they were destroyed by Ebert, and although they were, you know, Freikorps and Ebert, they tr managed to control them, they still remained a strong anti-government force throughout the 1920s. Now, on the right wing, we had the nationalists, the Freikorps. The Kapp Putsch was an attempted coup against the Weimar Republic. So, Putsch basically means coup. The Freikorps had helped Ebert defeat the left-wing communists. Remember in the previous video, the Spartacists, the Freikorps helped to defeat them. But the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, now the Treaty of Versailles meant that Germany had only 100,000 men in the army. No more than that, otherwise they'd be breaking the treaty. And the Freikorps were soldiers, right? So they couldn't be soldiers anymore. They were unhappy. The army was significantly reduced, leading to the Freikorps having to disband. So as a reaction to this, from the 13th to the 17th of March 1920, the right-wing nationalist Wolfgang Kapp let a Freikorps take over in Berlin. So that's why it's called the Kapp Putsch, because his name was Wolfgang Kapp. The Kapp Putsch, the takeover in Berlin by the Freikorps. And this time, Ebert couldn't, couldn't use his army against the Freikorps, because the Freikorps used to be ex-soldiers too. And they shared similar ideologies with the f soldiers. So the soldiers wouldn't fight, they would refuse to fight the Freikorps. However, luckily, the workers of Berlin went on strike. They refused to cooperate with the Cap and his Freikorps men. So, luckily, the people of Berlin were on their side. Cap left Germany and died awaiting trial. The Cap Putsch could be considered a success for Ebert and the Republic, since it appeared he actually did have the support of Germans because they refused to cooperate with Cap and his coup. However, the rest of the Freikorps were left unpunished. There were still thousands of Freikorps who were still there, and they were not punished at all. Some further political violence after the Spartacist uprising and the Cap Putsch. Although Ebert had managed to deal with the Cap Putsch, he had struggled to deal with the political violence in Germany. There was a lot of it. Political assassinations were very frequent. In the summer of 1922, Ebert's foreign minister, Walter Rathnow, was murdered by extremists. In the November of 1923, Adolf Hitler, does he sound familiar? You guys might know him, Adolf Hitler. Hmm? November 1923, he led an attempted revolution in Munich called the Munich Putsch. We'll cover this in coming video uh, in, in a bit later on. Both Hitler and Rathenau's murderers, they received very short sentences. And it seemed the Weimar's right-wing opponents had some friends in some very high places. So, why did they hate the Republic so much? The cause of most of these violences was, obviously, the signing of the Versailles Treaty. Many Germans were unhappy about it. They didn't like it. It was bad for Germany, and it really, they really hated it. Ebert was reluctant to sign the treaty, but he didn't have, the, he didn't have much of a choice. Like, he had, he was, obviously, no one wants to sign the Treaty of Versailles. Imagine you're German. Who would want to sign it? But German, the German army was in no position to continue war, so he knew the best thing the best alternative for Germans was to sign the Versailles Treaty. The harsh terms and the armistice caused anger against the Weimar government for years to come because it wasn't the extremist communists or the nationalists who signed it. It was the Weimar democratic government. It was the Weimar Ebert, Ebert who signed it. So they were the ones who received the hate for all the consequences related to the Versailles Treaty. Also, many Germans believed, believed they had not been stabbed, not been beaten in the battlefields, but rather stabbed in the back by politicians like Ebert. Why would they think this? Well, because little fighting took place within Germany itself. There was very little fighting actually happening within borders of Germany. It was actually outside because Germany was the country invading, right? So Germany didn't actually have much of much of fighting at all in its within its borders. So many Germans wouldn't actually see foreign troops entering the country until at least at the time of the armistice. So they'd be led to believe that Germany was doing quite well. They were winning the battle. And then suddenly this Ebert guy, the democratic guy, just comes and signed this treaty. What do you think? How would you feel? You'd feel like you're standing in the back, right? You feel like you didn't lose, but just the Ebert guy just came and just signed the treaty. You'd hate him. These politicians who signed the treaty were called the November criminals. You know, criminals for turning their backs on the German people and the German hardworking German soldiers and signing the treaty. They were called the November criminals. There was an economic disaster within the Weimar Republic, Germany. 
However, the Treaty of Versailles didn't just destabilize Germany politically, it also did so economically. Reparations, remember, the Treaty of Versailles meant Germany had to pay 6.6 .6 billion pounds to the Allies in reparations for starting their war. And it was paid in annual installments of 2% of Germany's output. This put a huge strain on Germany's already weak economy. Remember, they had lost war, right? They were struggling. And now they had to pay 6.6 .6 billion pounds, imagine. They were struggling to rebuild post-World War One. The first installment of 50 million pounds was paid in 1921, but in 1922, the following year, nothing was paid. Ebert tried to play for time, but the French had run out of patience. Because during the war, they also they borrowed money from the US to fund their war campaign, to defend themselves from Germany. They wanted money to pay back the US. So, the French ran out of patience. In January of 1923, French and Belgian troops enter the Ruhr Industrial Area. Now, what's this Ruhr Industrial Area? It was the biggest industrial area of Germany, and it was basically where all of Germany's factories, all of Germany's, like, you know, output where all of Germany's like you know exports were created so once Germany failed to you know pay their reparations French and Belgian troops come into this rural in that industrial area to take what is un what is owed to them in the form of raw materials and goods and the key thing to note is that they, it was done legally the French didn't just invade Germany <laughs> the government orders the workers to go on passive resistance so passive resistance basically means just refuse to work. Don't don't like fight the French who are coming in because that could cause war, but just, oh, I refuse to work, just something like that. So there would be nothing for French to take because if the factory workers don't work, there'd be no output, there'd be no goods for the French to take. The French react very harshly to this. They kill over 100 workers and they expel over 100,000 protesters from the rural industrial area. Now, hyperinflation also happens. Hyperinflation is basically when the currency becomes worthless, like it costs more to manufacture to print the money than it is actually worth. So because the government had no goods to trade, the Weimar Republic decided to print its money. Now guess what happens when you do that? To the government, it seemed like a good solution. It paid off their debts in worthless marks. Who cares if it's worthless? At least you get it done with. The German currency at the time was marks, by the way. But obviously this caused a chain reaction. Look at Zimbabwe now. <laughs> You have to pay like billions to buy a piece of like paper or something. Too much money in circulation, but not enough goods to buy using it. So there, people were paid like millions every day and there weren't enough goods being made. So remember the rural industry area that people were strike, they're on strike, not enough goods. Prices and wages skyrocketed, but people soon realized that this money that they were getting paid with the rural the, not the rule, sorry, the mark was worthless. It was it was basically just paper. The middle class lost a lot, like especially a lot. Their savings that could have bought a house in 1921, so prior to this hyperinflation, so imagine you had like a $100,000 in the bank. You couldn't even buy a loaf of bread in two, just two years later in 1923. A monthly pension of a guy couldn't even pay, buy a cup of coffee, coffee. So all the money that they had in their savings was basically worthless in a matter of years. The government lost the support of middle class who would support them imagine you could have you were saving money to buy a nice car a nice house and then a couple of months later you can't even buy a piece of paper with that how disappointed how mad would you be <coughs> excuse me the winners and losers surprisingly there were some winners of this hyperinflation crisis some winners were the borrowers the businessmen the people with mortgages could pay off their loans quickly and easily so imagine in 1921 you borrow some money from the bank to buy a new car and in two years later, the money's worthless. So you can just pay like what you make as a salary in a day and you still have that car. So you they gained a lot. So they could pay off their loans quickly and easily. People on wages, their wages were renegotiated daily. So like, you know, imagine you're a salaryman working in the office. You got paid like 10,000 marks per month. But the following day, the hyperinflation crisis happened. So now you get paid 100,000 marks per day. So their wages were negotiated every day because of this hyperinflation. But, you know, the prices keep rising, but even the rising wages eventually fail to keep up because you can't keep going up forever, right? And the farmers, their products were still in demand and farmers got money as prices spiraled because, you know, people still need to eat. So their products were still spiraled, uh, still in demand and people would buy it with the rising prices. They could just rise the prices as the economy crashed further and further. However, Lots lost too. So the opposite of these borrowers, those on fixed incomes, 
So the students, the pensioners, the ex, um, pensioners or students, so pensioners, like when you um, retire, you get paid from the government. There are, the government doesn't have money, so they can't keep paying you more and more. So the income failed to keep up with rising prices. And those with savings or those who had lent money to others. So the opposite of those borrowers who had borrowed money from these guys, they lost their vast fortune was essentially worthless. They were like 100K in the bank was worthless in a matter of days. Look at this man, the Weimar Republic under Stresman in 1923. So it, be, it was evident to everybody both within and outside of Germany that the Weimar Republic needed urgent action. So in 1923, the Weimar Republic was on the verge of collapse, right? Both socially and economically. It was clear to everyone, urgent action needed. August of 1923, a new government under Gustav Stresemann took over. Stresman only served as chancellor for 102 days. He didn't serve for a long time. He wasn't fired. He just continued to work as a foreign minister and continued to dominate German politics until his death in 1929. It's ironic because as soon as he dies, there is the Great Depression, which we will cover in this video, and everything just falls. Stresman made some urgent changes in a frantic attempt to save the Weimar Republic. So, let's take a look at some of the changes that happened under Stresman. So, he called off the passive resistance in the world. He told those workers to go back to work because they needed some stuff. They needed to trade. They needed money. He brought in the worthless marks. Remember, the government had printed off like billions in marks of worthless currency. He burnt them. He collected them in and burnt them. And he replaced them with a new currency called the Renton Mark. He renegotiated to receive American loans on the, the Dawes plan. So, he wanted to receive American loans so that they could rebuild their economy. He renegotiated reparations payments. And through the above, Germany's problems were solved surprisingly quickly. Some historians say it's proof that Germany's problems were not as serious as made out to be by politicians at the time. It was just a, a, a bad turn of events. It was, they were just unlucky. It wasn't as bad as people thought. So, the key point is that Stresman helped solve many of the issues that caused by the crisis of 1923 which led to economic and political stability. He solved the problems of 1923. But Germany became heavily reliant on loans from the US. We will cover this. Thanks to the US loans, the German economy survived. So some achievements of Stresman were the economy, the culture, the politics, and the foreign policy. It was all doing surprisingly well under Stresman. Some failures of Stresman, the economy, the culture, the politics, and the foreign policy. Notice any similarities? <laughs> economy, culture, politics, foreign policy? He, all his um, achievements came with its downsides. Some positives of Stresman under his, the economy. He ended hyperinflation and the economic crisis of 1923. So he told the workers to go back to work, the US loans. In 1923, the worthless marks were burned, right? Replaced with rent and mark. Following year, the Dawes plan, they received US loans of 800 million marks. And the reparations were to be spread over more time. In 1928, just four years later, now, Germany be achieved equal production to prior World War I levels. So as much as they were producing before World War I, and it became the second largest industrial power again, right after the US. So in less than like, when did World War I end? Like 1919, right? So in like less than 10 years, they became the strongest, second strongest industrial power again, even stronger than the UK or, or like France. The money from the loans was put into infrastructure, pools, apartments, and that created jobs. The wages rose for industrial workers, so there was a higher standard of, standard of living. The reparations were paid, and of course, higher standard. I repeated that. In 1929, the Young Plan was made to further reduce reparations. But it may or may not happen, because what happens in 1929? The uh, Great Depression. Now, so far, it's looking quite good for Weimar Republic. Their economy was prosperous, they were paying reparations, they got lots of US loans, everything was good, right? Some downsides, though. The economic boom was very precarious. It was ris risky. It was basically hanging on a single, narrow, thin thread, all dependent on the U.S. loans, which could be withdrawn at short notice, foreshadowing something that happens very soon. There was a lot of inequality. Many winners were the big businesses, the steel and chemical industries the, they were, who controlled 50% of Germany's industrial production. They were the winners, not the middle class. The big landowners also got lots. The Berlin's land price increased by 700%. That's a ton. Seven, time, seven times the amount it was prior to that. Small businesses, especially peasant farmers and the middle class, lost lots. 
The farmers were overproducing as less food was needed post-war. They didn't have a war anymore, so they had lower demand. And small businesses were, were threatened by large department stores, many being Jew-owned. Jew-owned. So these middle class who owned the small businesses, the corner shops in their small towns, they were threatened by these large department stores which were owned by the Jews. That's foreshadowing something, because who does the Nazis hate? The Jews. So if you hate the same people, you might as well support the Nazis, right? So it's foreshadowing something that happens. The Weimar culture. There was a cultural revival in Germany. During Kaiser's time, it was almost a dictatorship with strict, with strict censorship. P people didn't really have freedom. But the new Weimar constitution allowed for the free expression of ideas. Writers, artists, they flourished with modernist ideas and criticized politicians in everyday life. The cinema and nightlife also became major pastimes. It was hobbies. People could have enjoyed their new hobbies now. People turned their backs on traditional values that became more modern, free of censorship. And this warmer culture allowed like nightlife to be born. Nightclubs. People could actually enjoy themselves. But that come with its downsides. This new Weimar culture was big and exciting in big cities. But rural, conservative and elderly Germans were shocked by their decadent behavior in cities. So decadent basically means like a decline in moral standards. So it's like immoral. Organizations such as the Van der Vogel movement was a negative reaction to modernist ideas. People were disappointed and they started the Van der Vogel movement. They wanted a return to simple country values and less decadence in towns. As previously mentioned, moral decline. Some politics. The politics in the Weimar Republic was finally stable. There was no further attempted revolutions or coups after the Munich Putsch in 1923. The radical, extreme, Nazi communists gained little support because nobody really wanted radical solutions anymore because they were prosperous under the Weimar Republic. And the socialists, amongst others, worked well together with other groups from 1924 to 29, but it all falls apart with the Great Depression. Despite the apparent political stability of the Republic, both the Communists and the Nazis were building up their parties. They were, they were quiet, but they weren't destroyed. They were just preparing. 30% of votes were still going to those extremist parties. More concerningly, the right-wing groups that posed the greatest threat were being quiet. They weren't destroyed. They were just preparing. The Nazis began to collaborate with the right-wing Nationalist Party to appear more respectable, so they collaborated with the right-wing party too. So the Nazis started to gain some attention, right? They were more respectable to the people. But even more significantly, the national war hero Hindenburg was elected president in 1925. Key thing here, he was opposed to democracy. Foreign policy of Germany. In 1925, the Locarno treaties were signed that accepted Germany's western borders and proved that Germany was a peaceful nation. They were accepted into the League of Nations in 1926. It's basically the United Nations of this 1990s. Okay. The Stresman worked to adjust some terms under the Versailles Treaty. He removed French troops from the Rhineland. So the Rhineland was supposed to be occupied by French troops because it's extremely close to France and they were worried. The French were worried of another German invasion, so they wanted to make sure. But they removed the French troops and... Reparations were further reduced through the Young Plan, which may or may not happen, because it happened in 1929. Some downsides of the foreign policy. The Nationalists protested against Stresman joining the League of Nations and for signing the Locarno Treaty, seeing it as an acceptance of the Versailles Treaty. Because basically, if you once you sign these Locarno Treaties, you're basically tied in. You're accepting that you have lost the war, that you are responsible, and that you're accepting everything that was signed in the Versailles Treaty. The communists also hated the Locarno Pact because they saw it as a plan, a plot against the communist USSR government. Both the nationalists and the communists hated the Locarno. So both sides of the po political spectrum, both left and right wing, still hated the, uh, the Weimar Republic. Let's take a look at the evaluation, some ups and downs. Both the nationalists and the communists still hated the Weimar, you know. At least they were being quiet with no new, re new revolutions after the Munich Putsch in 1923, right? The culture was a hit, but some grandmas hated it. So they started their Van der Vogel movement to try combat this. Maybe the economy wasn't as good as thought to be. But at least they weren't putting money off to pay off debts anymore, right? So overall, the Weimar managed to fix itself up from the disasters of World War I and 1923. So many things, so maybe, 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 maybe things weren't too bad after all. Except the rise of Hitler and his domination by
by 1934. So, some backstory. Stresemann succeeded in stabilizing Germany, right? And the extremist opponents were far from gone. They were, st they were just quiet. They were preparing. Throughout the 20s, they were regrouping and organizing, waiting for their chance at power. One of these groups was the Nazi party. You've all heard of them before, right? So let's go back in time to see what the Nazis did in the 1920s. So the Republic was created in 1990. So the following year, the Nazis were created to turn themselves from an unpopular, obscure fringe party to the most popular party in Germany by 1933. All right, the key point. What did the Nazis stand for in the 1920s? Why did the Nazis have little success prior to the 30s? And why was Hitler able to become chancellor by 1933? They were the tiniest party. They were fringe party. They had no support. But in just 10 years, they became the most popular party to become chancellor. Hitler became, he was, he was like the highest ranking personnel in Germany within 10 years. How did that happen? And how did Germany console, how did Hitler consolidate his power as chancellor? So, Nazis in the 20s. Let's take a look. The origin of the Nazis, as we can see on the right, it was not Hitler. Originally began as the German Workers' Party led by Anton Drexler. Hitler joined in 1919. He wasn't actually the original founder of it. Drexler recognized Hitler's skills quickly and put him in charge of propaganda and political ideas of the party. In the 1920s, they announced their 25-point program and renamed themselves as the Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazi. By the way, these acronyms sound kind of strange. It's because they're German, so the acronyms are for German words. The 25-point program, what was it? What was, their Nazi, what was the Nazi ideology? It was the ab abolition of the Versailles Treaty. It was the Anschluss. Anschluss is the German word for union between Germany and Austria. Remember, Germany and Austria were quite close. They both spoke German. They were quite close together. Lebensraum, so it means living space for Germans and Germans. So they wanted Eastern Europe so that the Germans could have some more living space to roam around in. Lebensraum for Germans. Only true Germans in Germany, so there would be no Jews in particular. The Aryan race was superior. We all know this, right? Hitler hated the Jews. Large industries and businesses were to be nationalized by the government, and there should be a generous old age pension. There would be a Führer, a single leader with complete power, a dictatorship, and there would be a strong central government. So this Nazi 24, 25 point program, this part, this program here, it tried to appeal to everybody within Germany. It tried to not upset anyone, but it tried to make everybody happy about it. The socialists, so that meant more equality of wealth, pensions should improve, the public industry is nationalized, so they were happy about it. The nationalists, the independents, they wanted like, you know, patriots. The Versailles Treaty ab abolished the Germans in one country, Lebensraum. The racists, they were happy because the Nazis hated the Jews. The fascists were happy, the dictators, because they wanted a strong central government with a Führer. So it was, it basically tried to appeal to every single member of the political spectrum. So Hitler and the Nazis. In 1921, Hitler removed Drexler as leader. Hitler's energy, commitment, and above, above all, power as, as a speaker. He was a great speaker, by the way. It was attracting attention of a lot of people. Hitler had a clear and simple appeal. He stirred the nationalist passions in his audiences. People who wanted to become more patriotic, to make the country more... Like, he want, they wanted a great Germany again. Like, pr pr pri prior to World War I, they wanted a great, strong, wealthy Germany. Scapegoats. So Hitler provided scapegoats to blame for Germany's problems. The Allies, the Versailles Treaty, the November criminals, the communists, the Jews. And his meetings were so successful that opponents actually tried to disrupt Hitler's meetings. So, in 1921, he set up the SA, which you may also know as the Stormtroopers, to defend his meetings. It protected his meetings and disrupted those of others. So, Munich Putsch in 1923. By 1923, the Nazis were still a very minor party, but... They, st they managed to give a high profile. So, you know, in 1920, when Hitler first joined the Nazis, the Nazis were tiny. When he first joined, he was like the 55th member. They didn't, even have a, they didn't even have 100 members. So what's really interesting and quite interesting, if you look into this deeper, is that in the 1920s, the Nazis had like less than 100 people. In 10 years, they became the most popular party in Germany. That's so cool. Like, how did that happen? It's, isn't that interesting? You might not find it interesting, but I found it interesting. And even in 1923, although they got a bit of a profile, they still had like less than 100,000 people, 20,000. That's nothing. It's nothing in the grand scheme of things. 
but at least it's better than 55, right? During the hyperinflation crisis, and by the time of the Munich Putsch in 1923, it grew to 20,000. Still not much, but still better than nothing, right? November 1923, Hitler believed it was the moment to topple the Weimar government. While the government was preoccupied with the hyperinflation crisis, so this is back when uh, when Stresemann was just appointed, and he was combating the hyperinflation crisis caused by the overinflation and the, uh, you know, stuff with the uh, uh, French occupation of the rural industrial area. So they printed money and stuff like that. So the government was busy, right? He wanted to topple the government with his 20,000 people. Would he succeed? It's, uh, you know, you can hear from my voice. Would he succeed? So the 1923 Munich Putsch. On the 8th of November, 1923... Hitler hijacked a local government meeting and announced he was taking over the government of Bavaria, joined by Ludendorff, who was a famous general in World War I. Nazi stormtroopers began taking over government buildings. But the next day, Weimar forces hit back. Police rounded up the SA and 16 Nazis were killed. The rebellion ended in absolute chaos. Hitler fled but was arrested two days later. Hitler actually thought with his 20,000 Nazi SH stormtroopers he could beat the German Weimar government. <laughs> The aftermath, the short-term consequences. It was basically a disaster. He had miscalculated the mood of the Germans and the Nazis had been humiliated. He thought the Germans would support them, but they still had some faith within the Weimar Republic. They still supported the Weimar rather than Hitler. People didn't support him and he and other Nazis were charged with treason. The, Nazis par the Nazi party was banned temporarily and Hitler was prevented from speaking in public until 1927. Hitler was tried for treason and... He was sentenced to five years in prison. So long term, it, was actually, it wasn't actually too bad in the long term. As at Hitler's trial, he gained enormous publicity for himself and his ideas. And every word he said was reported in the newspapers. Remember, Hitler was a great public speaker. It would be, like, it would, it would be where Hitler shines best. It was a great place for Hitler to shine. And the judges were so impressed that he and his accomplices were punished very lightly. Ludendorff was completely free. He didn't even go to prison and Hitler only had to do five years in prison. The guidelines were a life sentence. And actually, of those five years, he only served nine months. Can you believe it? He started a coup and a, he started the Munich Putsch, but he only served nine months in prison, less than a year. And even that was in the comfort of Landsberg Castle. Listen to the name, Landsberg Castle. Sounds good from just the name, right? This showed Hitler had some support and sympathy from important figures in the legal system and the attention of important figures in the army, thanks to Ludendorff, the famous war general. So Hitler was down, but he wasn't out. It was just a temporary setback, and Hitler will return to show him who's the boss. So coming up, we have Hitler in prison, the Mein Kampf, the Nazis in the wilderness, the change of strategy, the Great Depression, and thanks to this depression, the rise in power of the Nazis. So Hitler's time in prison. You can see Hitler leisurely chilling in prison there, reading the newspaper. So, during his time in prison, he spent it writing a book titled The Mein Kampf. So, The Mein Kampf meant my struggle. It's German for my struggle. And it clarified and presented uh, his ideas about Germany's future. This was also when he concluded that the Nazis would not be able to to seize power by force. So until then, the Nazis tried to do coups and the Munich Putsch uprisings, right? That's when Hitler realized that it'd be quite difficult for him to take power that way. So he gives up and basically decides that they wouldn't be able to do it by force. They would have to work within the democratic system. They would have to get votes. They would have to get voted legally into power, into the Reichstag, have control so that they could destroy the system from within. So that they would become, so Hitler would become the chancellor and he could destroy it from within when he had power within the government. The Mein Kampf, my struggle. So it means my struggle in German, Mein Kampf. It's the book he wrote. It was a brief summary, national socialism. So it meant loyalty to Germany, racial purity, equality, and state control of the economy. Racism. The Aryans were the master race. All other races, especially the Jews, who we, uh, we know Hitler hated a lot, they were to be inferior. The armed force, the war and struggle were essential to the development of the Aryan race. Foreshadows some war stuff that happens once Hitler goes to power. 
Lebensraum living space for Germans, expansion east into Poland and Russia so Germans could have more living space. And there would be a fewer democracies weak. You know, that's kind of true. The Weimar Republic was struggling, made decisions quite difficult to make. Strength lies in total loyalty and only loyalty to the leader, the Fuhrer. So this Mein Kampf is pretty similar to the 25 points in the Nazi party, but it was more specific to Hitler, I guess. So the Nazis in the wilderness between 24 and 29. As soon as Hitler was released from prison on the 20th of December 1924, Hitler set about rebuilding the Nazi party so he could take power through domestic means, so he could kill it from within. He saw the communists build up their strength through youth organizations and recruitment drives, and soon the Nazis were basically doing the exact same thing. The Nazi candidates stood in the Reichstag elections for the first time in May of 1924, and they won 32 seats. That's not so bad, actually. First time in 32 seats. And encouraged by this, he created other Nazi organizations to promote Nazi ideas. Now, notice anything? Hitler was released on 20th of December 1924. If you're paying attention, I hope you are till now. I'm losing attention, I'm so tired. <laughs> I don't know how long this video is going to be, but May 1924, the Nazis stood in the Reichstag elections. So Hitler was in prison when this election happened. Confused? Here's a fact check. By the way, as mentioned before, all info is from this textbook, but the, the dates don't really make much sense, do they? 20th, 20th December 1924, Hitler was in the prison. Hitler was released from prison, December 1924. May 1924 was when the Reichstag elections and Hitler got 30, 32 seats. How does that work? And if my months are correct, May comes before December. How does this work? So, Nazi Party did participate, participate in the Reichstag elections in 1924, okay? Despite, so I did some research, right? So despite being banned, the Nazi party, the ban was lifted in 1925. So that still doesn't explain why they were able to participate in 1924. So prior to the ban being lifted, the Nazi party did find ways to circumvent the ban and continue their political activities. So they, it's basically a loophole. They changed their names to become the German Socialists as the Nazi party itself was banned at the time, right? Thanks to the Munich Putsch. And the party gained minimal support in these elections, winning only a small number of seats, like 30 or something, right? However, it was banned, it was, the ban was lifted shortly after the, the elections, and they continued their works under their original name, the Nazis, the National. It basically, it's basically an acronym for the Nazis. Um, remember, Hitler was in prison during, these, uh, during the election, so you might be confused. How did Hitler do this? So Hitler's absence was, he was absent. He didn't, like, leave prison temporarily just to participate in this, but he was still in prison, but, and his powers were significantly limited because he couldn't be personally involved in the campaign since he was in prison. I feel like the textbook is just awfully worded and it really should be revised. But anyways, back to history. So a change in Nazi strategy. So as seen in previously, Hitler won 32 seats in the Reichstag, right? In 1928 elections, four years later, the Nazis only got 12 Reichstag seats. So their number of seats in the Reichstag actually declined. What happened? It was a quarter of what the communists got. So they got even fewer votes than the communists. So their anti-Semitic, um, anti-Jew policies got them some support from the racists. They still had failed to win support over the workers. Industrial workers thought they were doing well in the in the Republic in the years leading up to 1929. Remember, there was an economic boom within the Weimar Republic thanks to US loans. But, but it would all crash in 1929. And remember, yeah, same thing. So the Nazis turned to the farmers who weren't doing so well. Here we have a nice, lovely stock image of some nice American farmers farming in Kentucky, whatever. Although the workers were doing well, thanks to the Weimar's economic boom, other groups weren't doing so much. Nazis gained more support from the peasant farmers and the middle class shopkeepers and small business people in country towns. Remember, these are the people who did not gain anything from the Weimar Republic's economic boom. So unlike Britain, Germany still had a large rural population that lived and worked on land, 35% of the population actually, and they weren't sharing in Weimar Germany's economic prosperity. The Nazis promised to help agriculture if they came to power, so that they highlighted the importance of peasants in their plans, and they were also praised as being the racially pure Germans. So Hitler was focused, folk, focused, focused on winning over new members, so he tried to strengthen the SA. In case you forgot, the SA was created by Hitler in 1920, so we just did that. In 1925, Hitler enlarged the SA. He tried to appeal to those who needed it. The unemployed, the, those who had lost jobs due to World War I, so they couldn't be soldiers anymore, 100,000 limit on the army, right? So for a membership fee, they could join and they were given food, uniform, and a place to sleep. 
approximately 55% of the SA was unemployed, and there, many of them were ex-soldiers covered, and Hitler told the SA to hold parades and to give out pamphlets, rather than uh, use violence to show their discipline and strength. It was kind of like the opposite of the communists who were being quite violent. By 1928, the Nazi membership had swollen to over 100,000. Hitler also set up a new group called the SS. It was similar to the SA, but the SS was created out of fanatically loyal SA men to Hitler to protect these Nazi leaders. So remember, the SS was those that protected the SA. No, no, what am I saying? The SS were those who were fanatically loyal to Hitler. So the SS were those who were extremely loyal to part of the SA that were those of the SA that were fanatically loyal to Hitler. And basically, they protected Nazi leaders. However, there was still no breakthrough. Despite the shift in strategy, targeting the farmers, the unemployed, etc., there was still no electoral breakthrough for the Nazis. They didn't really get much more votes. Even after all this hard work, appealing to the farmers, etc., 1928, there was still a fringe minority party with less than 3% of the support of the German population. They were still the tiniest, smallest party within the Weimar Republic and had even fewer seats than the communists in the Reichstag. Many Germans were uninterested in the extreme politics during the Stresemann years, 23 to 20, 29, right? Because it was quite prosperous thanks to this economic boom and the American loans. The Nazis would need something extreme to happen for them to gain popularity. So why were they success unsuccessful prior to the 30s? Success of the Weimar government, e economy, the foreign policy, the Locarno treaties, right? The Nazi aims were irrelevant to most Germans. They were doing they were quite quite well. They didn't want radical solutions to problems that did not exist. Disastrous 1923 Munich Putsch, lack of support in the police and the army. But they did have some successes at least, right? The Munich Putsch and Hitler's trial. They gained popularity, they, they gained awareness, targeting different groups for more support, the farmers. Hitler's great speaking skills. He was a great public speaker. The 25 points, it outlined the Nazis' aims, the SA expansion, and the Great Depression of 1929 and the rise of Nazis. Finally, something happens where the Nazis can gain some popularity. So, in 1929, the American stock market crashed, the Wall Street crash, you guys all know about it, right? It sent the U.S. into an a disastrous economic depression. Countries all over the world quickly began to feel its effects, especially Germany, because what are they depend on? American loans. American bankers and businessmen had lost tons of money. And who had they loaned lots of money to? The Germans. So they asked the German banks to repay the money they had borrowed. Remember, the Weimar econo e economic boom was all thanks to American loans. What do you think happens when all the money that they were dependent on disappears? It basically... I want to show this animation. Wow, there's an economic collapse. The businesses went bankrupt, workers were laid off, and unemployment skyrocketed. Kind of feels like deja vu, right? After World War I, this exact same thing's happened. And the Weimar government tried to act, but the Weimar constitution, with its careful balance of power, made firm, decisive action difficult. So, end to the Nazis, with its radical solutions and its one leader fewer strategy. The, Na the Hitler's ideas seem to have some special relevance now. So, is the Weimar government indecisive? Then Germany needs a new strong leader. Are reparations making the situation even worse than it already is? Well then kick out the Versailles Treaty. Is unemployment a huge problem? Let unemployed, let the unemployed join the army and build Germany's armaments. The Nazi's 25-point program was very attractive to those most vulnerable by the Depression, the unemployed, the elderly, and the middle class. So, what was the appeal of the Nazis to those Germans after the Great Depression? Hitler offered German culprits to, bl to blame, the, the scapegoats to blame, the Allies, the November criminals who signed the Versailles Treaty, and the Jews. No, none of these messages had worked before when Hitler tried them during the Stresemann years. The difference now was that the Democratic parties couldn't get Germany back to work. They used to have economic prosperity, but now it failed, and the Weimar government really wasn't looking good in fixing it. So, many Germans were struggling at losing faith. So the Nazis in the Reichstag. Remember, the Reichstag is the German parliament. In the 1930 elections, the Nazis got 107 seats, up from like 30 in November of 1932, they got almost 200, so it almost doubled in the span of two years. However, they still did not have overall majority, so that's having 50% of the seats and one extra seat. 
However, they were still they were the biggest single party now. So in like the 1920s, they had 50 members. And in 10 years, they managed to become the biggest party within Germany. So that's, that's quite an achievement, don't you think? So let's look at how the Nazis succeeded in their elections. The simple answer would be the Great Depression, right? The Great Depression led to the Nazi popularity. However, the longer answer is that there were six other factors that allowed the Nazis to seize this opportunity. Number uno. Nazi campaigning it was quite modern and effective. The biggest campaigning asset was Hitler. You know, he was a great public speaker, right? In 1932, by the 1933 elections, the Hitler, the Nazis were the biggest party. So in the same year, Hitler actually tried to ran, run for president. Despite his defeat, unfortunately, I guess, the campaign raised his profile hugely. He used modern technology such as films, records, radios to bring his message to millions of Germans. He appeared as the leader of a modern party with modern ideas. The Nazis relied on, German, on generalized slogans, uniting the people, going back to traditional values, and they didn't specify what this meant in terms of policies. So they didn't really specify what they were going to do if they got to power. So that made it quite difficult for, them, for people to criticize them. And they also backed up their campaign with action, real action, not just words, soup kitchens, free food, and rooms for unemployed, etc., now, this is a really important phrase, negative cohesion. I and mean, basically, it's very insanely, incredibly important. It's like the most important thing ever for Nazis coming to power. So, first of all, what is negative cohesion? First of all, let's first explain. People didn't really support Nazis because they shared Nazi views. That'd be positive cohesion, having the same beliefs. They didn't really support Nazi ideologies, but rather they shared Nazi fears. If you hate what I hate, then I will support you. If you hate the same things, you will Support them. It's like the enemy of my enemy is my ally. You know? If you hate what I hate, then I'll support you. Negative cohesion. So negative cohesion is... Negative is people that hate the same things, and cohesion is the bringing together of. So the bringing together of people that hate the same things. So who did both the Germans and Nazis hate then? The, 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 we'll cover that now. The disillusionment with democracy. Remember, disillusionment is something that is not as good as thought. The biggest negative cohesion could have been the disappointment with democracy in the Weimar Republic. People hated the Weimar Republic now because they were failing to give them jobs. The Germans wanted to work and there were no jobs thanks to the Great Depression. The politicians were unable to tackle the problems. And when the depression began to bite, Chancellor Brunig actually cut government spending and welfare benefits. You know what he told them to do? He told them to make sacrifices. Brunig made a disastrous decision calling for new elections in 1930. And this gave the Nazis an opportunity <clears throat> to exploit the discontent in Germany. Unemployment was at almost 6 million people. And, an average, and the average income had fallen by 40% since 1929. Negative cohesion of all those disappointed by Weimar's democracy. The decadence. So moral culture declined due to excessive indulgence in pleasure. For example, prostitution or drug dealing, etc. People, especially those in the rural areas, they, the Germans, the Nazis could count on all those that felt the tr traditional German values were under threat. The Nazis talked about restoring these, these old-fashioned values. They wanted to go back to the nice, calm, traditional Germany. Negative cohesion of all those that hated the Weimar culture, hating the same things, bringing together of negative cohesion. The communist threat. As the crisis deepened further, the support for extremist parties increased, including the communists. Both the Nazis and the communists were extremists. You can't forget that. So, the Nazis turned this to their advantage. And the fear of communism was yet another shared fear between the Nazis and the Germans. Negative cohesion in action, yet again. There were frequent battles between the communist gangs and the police. Remember, the communists were quite violent. In contrast... The SC and the SS gave an impression of discipline and order. Business owners feared, also, people were worried about what would happen under the communists. So, business owners, you're rich, right? They were wor worried about what would happen because communists wanted to introduce state control of businesses. They thought the Nazis would combat the threat because the Nazis hated the communists, right? So, some began to put money into Nazi campaign funds. Farmers were also fearful. So, in the USSR, which had a communist uprising, the communist government had taken over all land. Millions of peasant farmers were killed or imprisoned in the process. So the Nazis promised to help these poor peasant farmers. And number six, weak opposition. This is critical. The Social Democratic Party, the Socialists, made a grave mistake in thinking that the German people wouldn't fall for these vague promises of these Nazis. These vague 
unknown Nazi policies. People, they didn't really expect people to follow them, but people did, surprisingly. They also failed to work with other parties, especially the communists in particular, because they were the other biggest extremist party. And the socialists failed to cooperate with them. However, remember, in 1919 to 20, the Ebert had crushed the Spartacists, the communist uprising, and that had left too much, too many bitter memories to these communists. And the Nazis were able to exploit the divisions among their opponents. So, what is the bigger picture? The modern and effective Nazi campaigning, combined with Hitler's excellent public speaking skills, got the public's attention. Negative cohesion pretty much did the same, did all the rest. I mean, if you hate what I hate, then I'll support you. German people didn't necessarily share Nazi views, but they didn't hate the same things. Many Germans were disappointed with the Weimar government's handling of the Great Depression. Uh, the <clears throat> handling of power. Power was split so evenly that it'd be difficult for one party to take control and fix stuff. They really had two choices. The Germans had two choices. Either support the radical communists or the radical Nazis. Well, many didn't really like the communist policy, right? The, so, you know, the business order, the farmers, they would support the Nazis. Negative cohesion. If you didn't like decades of the Weimar culture, Nazis, negative cohesion. However, for the rest of the Germans, they could continue supporting the socialists because they didn't really have much to lose either way. But the future wasn't looking very bright. So why not support the radical Nazis? They might turn things around and things can't get much worse, right? So what happened? Nazi support skyrocketed. Many Germans, especially the middle class, who were having the worst time ever after the Great Depression, supported Hitler. All across Germany, from rural towns to cities. In rural communities, the Nazis got support from, the, from those who didn't like the decadent Weimar culture. And as you can see from this graph here, in 1928, the Nazis were basically nothing. But once, as soon as the Great Depression happened, the, look at the Nazi party. The NSDAP is the Nazis, by the way. The Nazis skyrocketed. They became the single largest party, and Hitler takes over in January 30th, 1933. Hitler becomes Chancellor, which we will cover now. So how did Hitler become Chancellor? So, originally, Hitler was actually denied the Chancellorship. After the Reichstag elections of July 1932, the Nazis were the single largest party with 230 seats in the Reichstag. However, they still did not have an overall majority, so that means having 50% of the seats and one extra seat. They did not have that. Hitler demanded the seat of the Chancellor, but Hindenburg, the president at the time, remember, he was suspicious of Hitler and refused to give him Chancellorship. He allowed the current Chancellor, Franz von Papen, to carry on being the Chancellor. Hindenburg then used his emergency powers, the Article 48 that basically removes democracy and becomes a dictatorship, to pass the measures that von Papen hoped would solve the unemployment problem. Would it work? First of all, once Hitler was denied the chancellorship, Hitler ordered the SANSS to cause more chaos on the streets and Nazi members of the Reichstag, this is the key part, to always vote against the government. That would mean whoever the chancellor was, unless it was a Nazi member, <clears throat> Hitler, it would be very difficult for the chancellor to make any laws unless they used the emergency powers because the Nazis would always vote against them. Remember, they, had, they were the single biggest party. So the chancellor was in trouble. What a nice flattering image for, of von Papen. So von Papen was in trouble. He had virtually no support in the Reichstag. So he called yet another election. So the January 19, November 1932 elections. The Nazis yet again came out as the largest party, but their vote did fall slightly, and Hitler regarded the election a disaster. They lost over 2 million votes along with 38 seats in the Reichstag. So it was starting to look like the tide had, uh, the tide had turned, and Hitler was starting to lose power. Hitler lost funds, and it's said that he even threatened suicide, or had it. Like the graph here, Nazis were still the single largest party, but the socialists and communists combined together, the KPD and the SPD, if you combine them, they'd be 36%, which would be greater than the Nazis. So imagine how powerful they could have been if they combined the, Nash, the communists and the socialists. But that never happened, because the socialists destroyed the communists during the Spartacist revolution, so they hated each other. So, Hitler is denied yet again. <laughs> Hindenburg refused again to appoint Hitler as Chancellor. So, in December of 1932, Hindenburg appoints Kurt von Schleicher, one of his own advisors and a bitter rival of von Papen as chancellor. And by the way, von Schleicher hates um, uh, Hitler. He's a strong uh, critic of Hitler. But he had the same problem as von Papen. He had no support of the Reichstag. And within the month, due to a lack of support, von Schleicher was also forced to resign. By then, it was clear that the Weimar system of government was basically not working. It was not going to work. It would never work. The system of balances and proportional representation meant that no political party was able to provide strong rule. Because of this Weimar, Demo Weimar democracy's strong 
distribution of power, it would be difficult for one party to you know, just pass a law that they wanted because nobody would have majority control. And this had left President Hindenburg, who was 84 years at the time, that's foreshadowing something by the way, to more or less rule the country using his emergency powers, Article 48. In a way, Hindenburg had already overthrown democracy because Article 48, it's not really a democracy anymore, right? To rescue the democratic system, he would need a chancellor who had support within the Reichstag. So, here is Hitler's road to chancellor. Through January of 1933, Hindenburg met secretly with von Papen and other army leaders and politicians. On 30th of January 1933, to everybody's surprise, they offered Hitler the, the post of chancellor. Why would they do this? Hitler was this radical extremist who wanted to turn things around. Why would these socialist Weimar leaders agree to do this? It makes no sense, right? Why? So why? The plan was simple. They thought they could control Hitler whilst benefit, benef benefiting from him. They wanted to use Hitler to their advantage. With only a few Nazis in the cabinet, they thought and von Papen as vice chancellor, you see here, they were very confident they could restrict Hitler's influence and his extremist demands. And Papen managed to persuade Hindenburg. And the idea was that policies would be made by the cabinet, which was filled with conservatives like von Papen. Hitler, there was actually only two Nazi members in the cabinet. Hitler would simply be there to get support in the Reichstag for those policies and to control the communists. Hitler would just be like a puppet, just getting the support of the Nazis and the Reichstag so that they could pass, so that the socialist leaders in the back could really pass the laws that they really wanted to pass. So, it all makes sense now, right? So Hitler becomes chancellor. On 30th of January 1933, Hitler becomes chancellor of Germany and Hitler and von Papen are certain. Oh, I made a typo here. It's not both Hitler and von Papen. Hindenburg, both Hindenburg and von Papen are certain they can control Hitler. Would Hitler do as they wanted? They were very wrong. How Hitler consolidates his power to become the Fuhrer of Germany by 1934. So here's a bit of a timeline. 1933 January, Hitler becomes the Chancellor of Germany, right? So here's all the small events that happen. We're going to cover all of these in more detail, but we're in more specifically, we're going to look at the Reichstag fire, the Enabling Act, the and the uh, Night of Long Lives and how Hitler finally becomes the Fuhrer of Germany on the 2nd of August 1934. Let's get to it. So Hitler consolidates his position. When Hitler became Chancellor in, the, in January of 1933, he was in an extremely precarious position. Where did we use the word precarious before? It was used when, uh, it, it basically, first of all, it means when you're hanging on a thread, right? So that was when the Weimar Republic was in its hyperinflation, uh, not hyperinflation, economic prosperity, economic boom, all thanks to these U.S. loans, and it was all hanging on a thread on these U.S. loans, and it all eventually crashes, right? Would the same thing happen to Hitler? Probably not, because World War II happens. How would that happen without Hitler getting power? So few thought that he would hold on to power for long. Even fewer thought that by the summer of 1934, within a year of becoming a chancellor, he would be the supreme dictator of Germany, the Fuhrer, not even the president, the supreme dictator of Germany, the Fuhrer. He achieved this through a clever combination of methods, some legal, others not so much. He also managed to reach agreements with those who could have stopped him. So anyone who could have had the power to stop him, he managed to agree, make agreements with them so that they wouldn't be able to do so. So an important thing was Hindenburg was still president at the time, 1933, and he could still use his power to sideline Hitler. But does that happen? Probably not. So the Nazi takeover of Germany. Oh, once Hitler becomes chancellor, Hitler, Hitler took steps to complete a Nazi takeover. He called another election for March of 1933 to try and get an overall majority. And whilst doing so, he used the same tactics as in previous elections, but this time he was chancellor, right? He had the resources of the state media and the control of the streets. But even so, success was in the balance. On 27th of Feb 1933, there was a dramatic development. Step one into Hitler's plan of becoming the Fuhrer of Germany, the Reichstag fire. So we're, now we're in part two of this timeline. The Reichstag fire. The Reichstag building burnt down and basically Hitler blamed the communists and declared the fire was the beginning of his communist uprising. A Dutch communist was a, a, arrested, but you know, who knows if it was done by himself as part of the communist group or if he was ordered to do so by Hitler himself. Nobody will know. He demanded special emergency powers, part of Article 48, because he used this Reichstag fire as an excuse, which Hitler may or may not have started, to deal with the situation and was given them by President Hindenburg. That might be the first mistake Hindenburg makes after appointing, second mistake actually, because he appointed Hitler as Chancellor. So the Nazis used these powers, the dictatorship pretty much, to break up the communists, to arrest the communists, to break up meetings and to frighten the voters. 
Furthermore, police powers are increased and personal freedom was suspended, with the excuse being the communist uprising, so they need to control it. So it's basically a dictatorship at this point. Hitler used the SNSS to arrest over 4,000 communists and all their opponents. So effectively, thanks to this Reichstag fire, which Hitler used as an excuse, the communists, which were like the second or the third most powerful political party at the time, who were like enemies of the Nazis, they were arrested, effectively banned. So now Hitler only had the socialists to, con to worry about. So the cause of this, a Reichstag fire. It could have been an accident, the work of a ma uh, mad met <clears throat> Hitler, Hitler, <clears throat> a communist plot. And many Germans at the time thought it was the work of Hitler, them of the Nazis themselves. Now, step three, step two in Hitler's plan to become the Fuhrer, the Enabling Act. Kind of sounds cool, right? The Enabling Act. What are they enabling the Nazis to do? March of 1933, a month after the Reichstag fire and two months after the, be Hitler becoming the Chancellor. Enabling Act. Remember the March 1933 um, election Hitler called for? In the election, the Nazis won their largest share of votes, and together with the smaller nationalist party, they finally had an overall majority. They didn't have an overall majority with the Nazis alone, they had to like make a partnership with the nationalist party. But now they finally had more than 50% of the seats in the Reichstag. Using the SD and the SS, Hitler intimidated the Reichstag into passing the Enabling Act. So, what is this Enabling Act? It allows Hitler to pass laws without consulting the Reichstag. It basically allows Hitler to use his emergency powers without having an emergency himself. So, it's basically a dictatorship without having, having an emergency. Even though, not even the President Hindenburg had to be consulted to allow this act to be passed. So, only the SPD, the Socialists, were those who voted against him because they were so intimidated by the SA and the SS. No communist thanks to the Reichstag fire. Remember, 2000, like, the communists were effectively banned. So how did this help Hitler? The effects. For the next four years, the term for chancellor. If Hitler wanted a new law, he could just pass it. He didn't have to consult Hitler. Not Hitler. He didn't have to consult Hindenburg or the Reichstag. He could just pass it whenever and whatever he wanted. Basically a dictatorship. There was nothing President Hindenburg or anyone else could do. However, remember, Hitler, Hindenburg could still dismiss Hitler. He just couldn't do anything about this um, uh, enabling act. Hindenburg still had power to dismiss Hitler. He had seen how other groups, such as the Civil Service Army, had undermined the Weimar Republic. Hitler had seen that. So Hitler, Hitler wasn't strong enough to remove his opponents. So he, he set about a clever policy that makes forced concessions and compromise. So what is this? It's the Night of Long Knives. So now we are in June of 1934. So what happened in the months leading up to it? Because between the enabling act of March 1933 and 30th of June 1934, over a year has passed. It's, it's gone from 1933 to 34. From the enabling act to the night of long knives. So what happened in all these months? So if you know, if you look at this um, timeline carefully, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. So every single month, Hitler pretty much did something to consolidate, to further consolidate his power. So in April of 1933, Hitler, the civil service, the court, and education was purged of all alien elements. So alien elements, alien kind of sounds like the enemy, right? You're you're worried about them. So it was those who the Nazis were worried of. So basically, the Nazis got rid of the Jews and the Nazi opponents who they were worried of from power, from positions of power, so that make it hard for them to make uprisings, right? So following month in May of 1933. Trade unions were banned and everybody was under this Nazi party. So basically that make it hard for different workforces to start uprisings or like protests, right? Because if they're unhappy about something, there would be no trade unions except the Nazi one. The following month, the employment law was passed that allowed the, basically it made like public work, it started public work, so it, like building infrastructure like roads, bridges or buildings. So that created some new jobs. Following month in July, law against the formation of new parties. This one is very key. It banned the creation of new parties. So it banned, it basically got rid of any potential opponents of the Nazis that could potentially arise. It got rid of that. And the concordant agreement, a concordat agreement with the Catholic Church, basically, um, it allowed the uh, Catholic Church to continue their free religious practice, but they were banned from having any um, connection with the political. They couldn't. The Catholic Church couldn't participate in political events. So that basically meant that if the Catholic Church was unhappy about something with the Nazis, they wouldn't be able to do anything. And the many of many Germans were Catholic, right? So it make it difficult, right, for the Catholic Party to say, "Oh, we hate the Nazis. Oh, let's let's start a coup against them." You know, made it difficult for them to do that. In January 1934, all state governments are taken over by the Nazis. And in 30th of June 1934, we are finally at the Night of Long Lives. I love this guy's hair. Within a year between 1933 and 34, remember we just covered this, any opponents, including the potential ones, thanks to the new parties being banned, Nazis were either in, uh, the enemies of Nazis were either in concentration camps run by the Nazis themselves, or they had left Germany. Other political parties had been banned. Remember, Hitler still wasn't secure though. 
Leading officers in the army were still unsure about Hitler himself, and they were particularly suspicious of Hitler's SA and its leader, Ernst Röhm. The SA under Röhm was a particular problem for Hitler. Röhm actually controlled 4 million, he was the leader of the SA, SA, SA group, the 4 million undisciplined SA men, and sought to make the SA into a second German army. So, that worried the army leaders, right, because they don't want a second German army, and that also made Hitler worried because Rome's control of 4 million SA men made him a potential dangerous rival to Hitler. What if he decided to fight against Hitler and become the new Führer or dictator or the government chancellor, whatever, of Germany? Hitler would have to choose between the SA and the army. Remember, the SA was loyal to Hitler. It was, they were with Hitler from the very beginning, from 1925, whenever it was created. And now, he would have to choose between that or the new army, which basically had no loyalty to Hitler. So, Night of Long Knives. I couldn't really find an image of the Long, long Knives because it's an invasion and, you know, you don't really record stuff like that, especially in the 1990s. And we have the SA, we have a random FBI raiding a house and just imagine they're the SS men. So, Hitler made his choice and he acted very ruthlessly, without any mercy. On this weekend of 29th to 30th of June, 1934, squads of SS men, remember the SS was those who were fanatically loyal to Hitler. They broke into the houses, homes of Rome, the leader of the SA, and other leading figures in the SA, and arrested them. Hitler accused Rome of plotting to overthrow and murder him. And over the weekend, Rome and possibly as many as 400 others were executed by the SS. These included former Chancellor von Schleicher, remember he was the Chancellor that replaced von Papen, who, um, <clears throat> he was a fierce critic of Hitler and others who actually had no connection to Rome at all. This purge is what is called the Night of Long Nam. So what happened? I can't really find a medal, but here's a Hitler with a nice photoshopped image of a very pixelated medal. President Hindenburg thanked Hitler for his actions and the German army now believed Hitler's loyalty was with them and not the SA. The SA had not disbanded, though it remained an, it still remained an, uh, as an anti paramilitary organization, but was very much a subordinate of the SS. It was basically working underneath the SS, so the SS was more powerful. And by the way, what is the uh, paramilitary organization? Paramilitary basically just means like unofficial army, so it doesn't really, it's not really an army for the country, but it's like the, it's like basically like the security guards you see at malls, like some security guys who have arms, but they don't really do much. Okay, many of its members were absorbed by the army and the SS. The many SA members actually. So Hitler now needed now had no enemies and only needed one more step. He just wanted to become the Führer of Germany. That's it. So step four, the Army Oath, 1934 August 2nd. Hitler becomes the Führer of Germany. The key person who dies is the death of Hindenburg. Remember, Hindenburg was quite old. He wasn't young. He wasn't in his 30s. He was very old. Soon after the Night of Long Knives, President Hindenburg died on August 2nd, 1934. And by the way, Hindenburg is much older than Joe Biden himself, so you can, that just kind of gives you a grasp of how old Hindenburg is. Hitler used the Enabling Act, remember, he created it. He could pass laws without consulting the Reichstag to make himself the Führer of Germany. And by the way, Hindenburg wasn't murdered by Hitler, don't get any nasty ideas. He, he died due to lung cancer at age 86. So the Army Oath. On the same day as Hindenburg's death, August 2nd, 1934, the entire German army swore an oath of personal loyalty to Hitler as Führer of Germany. The army agreed to stay out of politics and to serve Hitler and only Hitler himself. In return, Hitler spent lots on rearmament, brought back conscription, and made plans to make Germany a great military power again, all of which broke the Versailles Treaty signed back in 1919, foreshadowing something that happens in a couple of years' time. World War II <clears throat> may or may not happen, but why, do we, why did I just say it? <laughs> Might happen. So how did Hitler get here again? Let's travel back in time to 1919. Back to the future. Nazi party formed in 1919. Hitler soon becomes its leader. The 25-point program appeals to unemployed ex-soldiers and the right-wing nationalists, but not much more, at least at the, at the time. Hitler was sent to prison due to the Munich Putsch that he tried to do with like 20,000 SA members, barely anything, like, I don't know why he did that, and write the book Mein Kampf, he wrote the book, and he set out his ideas. The Nazi party reorganizes in the 1920s, but it's still an extremely tiny party by the 1928. So they had less than a million members, so it was like, they were still like the tiniest party in the Weimar Republic. And they, they started to have a shift in strategy from the workers who were quite prosperous under the Nazis, uh, under the Weimar's economic prosperity boom, economic boom, thanks to US loans, and they shifted to farmers and the middle class who were struggling and weren't really benefiting from the Weimar economic boom. The Great Depression of 1929, remember, the Weimar's boom was all hanging on a thread. It was all dependent on this 
um, American loan. And once America went into their Wall Street, Wall Street crash, they wanted their loans back. Unemployment, economic hardship came for Germans. Nazi flourishes and their ideas gained popularity because people wanted extremists. Radical solutions to their uh, extreme problems. Hitler's excellent speaking skills and po- and people's disillusionment, so disappointment in Weimar, his democratic system to control, to fix what happened, makes the extremists really popular. Both the Nazis and the communists were popular. The communist violence, however, worried people, and negative cohesion to people who hated the same things like the business owners, the farmers, etc., or the rural community leaders who didn't like... Uh, the new decadent Weimar culture, they supported the Weimar popul- uh, Weimar party, so they became the, the Nazis became the most popular party by 1932. The Weimar leaders tried to use Hitler for their own advantage to try to get control of the Reichstag and to use Hitler as basically a puppet. But they failed and they get outsmart- outsmarted by the Enabling Act, which Hitler creates and allows Hitler to pass those without considering the Reichstag. And by 1934, Hitler becomes the Fuhrer of Germany. So in 2nd of August 1934, Hitler becomes the Fuhrer of Germany, and World War II starts on 1st of September 1934. 1930- 39, just over five years after Hitler becomes Fuhrer. Thank you for watching this extremely long video of Stuplained. I hope this explained this Weimar Republic history and goes in depth quite a lot. Please like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. And I'll catch you guys in the next one.